Hello everyone and welcome to India Reads. We are reading the story of my experiments with truth by Mahatma Gandhi and uh, the story of Gandhi has moved from Gujarat to Bombay to England to South Africa and is returning to India. So we are at uh, part 3, uh, section 12, return to India. So let's get reading. <clears throat> On my relief from war duty, I felt that my work was no longer in South Africa, but in India. Not that there was nothing to do, nothing to be done in South Africa, but I was afraid that my main business might become merely money making. Friends at home were also pressing me to return, and I felt that I should be of more service in India. And for this work in South Africa, there were, of course, Messrs. Khan and Mansur Lal Nazar. So I requested my co workers to relieve me. After great difficulty, my request was conditionally accepted. The condition being that I should be ready to go back to South Africa if within a year the community should need me. I thought it was a difficult decision, but the love that bound me to the community made me accept it. The Lord has bound me with the cotton thread of love. I am his bond slave, sang Mirabai. And for me too, the cotton thread of love that bound me to the community was too strong to break. The voice of the people is the voice of God, and here the voice of friends was too real to be rejected. I accepted the condition and got their permission to go. By this time, I was intimately connected only with Natal. The Natal Indians bathed me with the nectar of love. Farewell meetings were arranged at every place and costly gifts were presented to me. The gifts had been bestowed on me before when I returned to India in 1899, but this time the farewell was overwhelming. The gifts, of course, included things in gold and silver, and there were articles of costly diamond as well. What right had I to accept all these gifts? Accepting them, how could I persuade myself that I was serving the community without remuneration? All the gifts, except a few from my clients, were purely for my service to the community, and I could make no difference between my clients and co-workers, for the clients also helped me in my public work. One of the gifts was a gold necklace worth 50 guineas, meant for my wife. But even that gift was given because of my public work and so it could not be separated from the rest. The evening I was presented with the bulk of these things, I had a sleepless night. I walked up and down my room deeply agitated but could find no solution. It was difficult for me to forego gifts worth hundreds. It was more difficult to keep them. And even if I could keep them, what about my children? What about my wife? They were being trained for a life of service and to an understanding that service was its own reward. I had no costly ornaments in the house. We had been fast simplifying our life. How could we afford to have gold watches? How could we wear gold chains and diamond rings? Even when I was exhorting people to conquer infatuation for jewellery, what was I now to do with the jewellery that had come upon me? I decided that I could not keep these things. I drafted a letter, created a trust of them in favor of the community and appointing Parsi Rustamji and other trustees. In the morning, I held a consultation with my wife and children and finally got rid of these of the heavy incumbents. I knew that I should have some difficulty in persuading my wife and I was sure that I would have none so far as my children was concerned. So I decided to constitute them my attorneys. The children readily, readily agreed to my proposal we do not need these costly presents, we must return them to the community and so, and should we ever need them, we could easily purchase them, they said. I was delighted, then you would plead with mother, won't you? I asked them. Certainly, they said, that's our business, she does not need to wear ornaments, she would want to keep them for us and we do not want them. Why would she not agree but to part with them? But that was easier said than done. You may not need them, said my wife, your children may not need them cajoled, they will dance to your tune. I can understand you not permitting me to wear them, but what about my daughter in laws daughters in law? They sure will need they are sure they will be sure to need them and who knows what will happen tomorrow. I would be the last person to part with my gifts so lovingly given. Thus the torrent of argument went on, reinforced in the end by tears. But the children were adamant and I was unmoved. I mildly put in the children have yet to be yet to get married. We do not want to see them married young. When they are grown up, they can take care of themselves. And surely we shall not have for our sons brides who are fond of ornaments. And if after all we need to provide them with ornaments, I am there. You will ask me then. Ask you? I know you by this time. You deprived me of my ornaments. You would not leave, leave, leave me in peace with them. Fancy you offering to get ornaments for daughters-in-law. 
who are you trying to make sadhus of my boys from today no the ornaments will not be returned and pray what right do you have to my necklace but i rejoined is the necklace given to you for your service or for my service i agree but the service rendered to you is as good as rendered by me i have toiled and moiled for you day and night is that no service you forced all and sundry on me making me weep bitter tears and i slaved for them these were pointed threats and some of them went home but i was determined to retain, return the ornaments i somehow succeeded in exhorting a consent from her the gifts received in 1896 and 1901 were all returned a trust tree were was prepared and they were deposited in with the bank to be used for the service of the community according to my wishes or to those of the trustees often when i was in need of funds for public purposes and i felt that i must draw upon that trust i have been able to raise the requisite amount leaving the trust money intact the fund is still there being operated upon in times of need and it has regularly accumulated i have never regretted the step and as the years have gone by my wife has also seen its wisdom it has saved us from many temptations i am definitely of the opinion that a public worker should never accept no costly gifts 13 in india again so i sailed for home mauritius was one of the, our ports of call and as the boat made a long haul there i went ashore and acquainted myself well with the local conditions for one night i was a guest of charles bruce the governor of the colony after reaching india i spent some time in going about the country it was in the year 1901 when the congress met at calcutta under the presidency of leader sir dinshaw vacha and i of course attended it it was my first experience of the congress from bombay i traveled in the same train as sir firoz shah mehta as i had to speak to him about the conditions in south africa i knew the kingly style in which he lived he had uh, engaged a special salon for himself and i had the orders to take my opportunity to of speaking to him by traveling in a salon for one stage i therefore went to the salon and reported myself at the appointed station with him were mr vacha and now and mr now sir chimanlal setalwar they were discussing politics as soon as sir firoz shah saw me he said gandhi it seems nothing can be done for you of course we will pass the resolution you want but what rights do we have in our country i believe that so long as we have no power in our own land you cannot fare better in the colonies i was taken aback mr setalwar seemed to concur in the view mr vacha cast a pathetic look at me i tried to plead with sir firoz shah but it was out of question for one like me to prevail upon the unconquered king of bombay i contented myself with the fact that i should be allowed to move my resolution you will of course show me the resolution said mr vacha to cheer me up i thanked him and left them at the next stop so we reached calcutta the president was taken to his camp with great eclat by the reception committee i asked a volunteer where i was to go he took me to ribbon building where a number of delegates were being put up fortune favored me lokmane was put up in the same block as i i have a recollection that he came a day later and as was not as was natural lokmane would never be without his darbar where i a painter i could paint him as i saw him seated on his bed so vivid is the whole scene in my memory of the numberless people that called on to him i can recollect only one today namely the late babu motilal ghosh editor of the amrita bazar patrika they allowed laughter and their talks about the wrong doings of the ruling race can not be forgotten but i propose to examine to some extent the appointments in this camp the volunteers were clashing with one another you asked one of them to do something he delegated it to the other and he in turn to the third and so on and as for the delegates they were neither here nor there i made friends with a few volunteers i told them things about south africa and they were somewhat ashamed uh, i tried to bring home to them the secret of service they seemed to understand but service is not a mushroom growth it presupposes the will force and then the experience there was no lack of will on the part of these these good simple hearted young men but their experience was nil the congress would meet 3 days later and then go to sleep what training could one have out of 3 days show once a year and the delegates were peace were of a peace with the volunteers they had no better or longer training they would do nothing themselves volunteer do this volunteer do that with their constant orders even here i was face to face with untouchability in a fair measure the tamil in kitchen was far away from the rest to so tamil delegates even at the sight of others whilst they were diving 
dining meant pollution so a special kitchen had to be made for them in the college compound world in vibeka work it was full of smoke that choked you it was a kitchen dining room washroom all in one a close safe with no outlet to me it looked like a travesty of var varna dharma if i said to myself there was untouchability between the delegates of the congress one could well imagine the extent to which it existed among their constituents i heaved a sigh at the thought there was no limit to this insanity insanitation pools of water were everywhere there were only a few latrines and the recollection of this thing still oppresses me i pointed it out to the workers they said point blank this is not our work this is a scavenger's work i asked for a broom the man stared at me at one i procured one and cleaned the latrine but that was for myself the rush was so great and the latrines were so few that they needed frequent cleansing but that was more than i could do so i had to contain myself with simply ministering to myself and the others did not seem to mind the stench and the dirt but that was not all some of the delegates did not scruple to use the verandas outside their rooms for calls of nature at night in the morning i pointed out the spots to the volunteers nobody was ready to undertake the cleaning and since i found no one to share the honor with me of doing it conditions have since then improved but even today thoughtless delegates are not wanting who disfigure the congress camp by committing nuisances wherever they choose and all the volunteers are not ready to clean clean up after them i saw that if the congress session were to be prolonged conditions would be quite favorable for a outbreak of an epidemic clerk and bearer there were yet two days for the congress session to begin i made up my mind to offer my services to the congress office in order to gain some experience so as soon as i finished the daily ablutions on arrival at calcutta i proceeded to the congress office babu bupendranath basu and sergeant goshal were the secretaries i went to bupen babu and offered my service services he looked at me and said i have no work possibly goshal babu might have something to give you please go to him so i went to him he scanned me and said with a smile i can give you only clerical work will you do it certainly said i i am here to do anything that is not beyond my capacity that's the right spirit young man he said addressing the workers who surrounded him he added do you hear what the young man says then turning to me he proceeded well there is a heap of letters for disposal take the chair and begin as you see hundreds of people come in here to see me what am i to do am i to meet them or am i to answer these busy bodies inundating me with letters i have no clerks to whom i can entrust the work most of these letters have nothing in them but if you please look through them acknowledge those that are worth it and refer to me those that need a considered reply i delighted at the confidence reposed in me sergeant goshal did not know me when he gave me the work only later did he inquire about my credentials i found my work very easy the disposal of that heap of correspondence i had done it done i had done with it in no time and sergeant goshal was very glad he was talkative he would talk away for hours together when he learned something about from me about my history he felt rather sorry to have given me the clerical work but i reassured him please do not worry what am i before you you have grown grey in the service of the congress and you are an elder to me but i am but an inexperienced youth you have put me under a debt of obligation by entrusting me with this work for i want to do congress work and you have given me the rare opportunity of understanding the details to tell you the truth said sergeant goshal that is the proper spirit but young men of today do not realize it of course i have known the congress since its birth in fact i may claim a certain share with mr hume in bringing bringing the congress into being and thus we became good friends he insisted on my having lunch with him sergeant goshal used to get his shirt buttoned by his bearer i volunteered to do the bearer's duty and i loved to do it as my regard for elders was always great when he came to know this he did not mind my doing little acts of personal service for him in fact he was delighted asking me to button his shirt he would say you see the congress secretary has no time even to button his shirt he would all he would he always has some work to do sergeant goshal's naivete amused me but did not create any dislike in me for service of that nature the benefit i received from the service was incalculable in a few days i came to know the workings of the congress i met most of the teachers i leaders i observed the movements of stalwarts like gokhale and surendranath i also noticed a huge waste of time there i observed too with sorrow even then the prominent place that the english language occupied in our affairs there was little regard for economy of energy more than one did the work of more than one did the work of one and many an important thing was no one's business at all critical as my mind was in observing these things there was enough clarity in me 
So I always thought that it might, after all, be impossible to do better in the circumstances. And that saved me from undervaluing any work. In the Congress. In the Congress, at last, the immense pavilion and the volunteers in the stately array as also the leers seated on the dais overwhelmed me. I wondered where I should be in that vast assemblage. The president's address was a book by itself. To read it from cover to cover was out of question. Only a few passage passages were therefore read. And this came the election of the sub after this came the election of the subjects committee. Gokhale took me to the committee meetings. Sir Feroz Shah had of course ad agreed to admit my resolution, but I was wondering who would put it before the subjects committee and when. For there were lengthy speeches to every resolution, all in English to boot, and every resolution had some well-known leader to back it. Mine was a f was but a feeble pipe amongst those veteran drums, and the night was closing in. And as the night was closing in, my heart beat fast. The resolutions coming in at the fag end were, so far as I can recollect, rushed through at lightning speed. Everyone was hurrying to go. It was 11 o'clock. I had the I had not the courage to speak. I had already met Gokhale who had looked at my resolution. So I drew near his chair and whispered to him, please do something for me. He said, your resolution is not out of, your, out of my mind. You see the way they are rushing through the resolutions, but I will not allow yours to be passed over. So we have done, said Feroz Shah Mehta. No, no, there is still the resolution on South Africa. Mr. Gandhi has been waiting long, cried out Gokhale. Have you seen the resolution? Asked Sir Feroz Shah. Of course. Do you like it? It's very good. Well then, let us have it, Gandhi. I read it trembling. Gokhale supported it. Unanimously passed, cried out everyone. You will have five minutes to speak on it, Gandhi, said Mr. Vacha. The procedure was far from pleasing to me. No one had trouble to understand. No, no, no one had trouble to understand the resolution. Everyone was in a hurry to go, and because Gokhale had seen the resolution, it was not thought necessary for the rest to see it or understand it. The morning found me worrying about my speech. What was I say? What was I to say in five minutes? I had prepared myself fairly well, but the words would not come to me. I had decided not to read my speech, but to speak as tempore. But the faculty for speaking that I had acquired in South Africa seemed to have left me for the moment. As soon as it was time for my resolution, Mr. Vacha called out my name. I stood up. My head was reeling. I read the resolution somehow. Someone had printed and distributed among the delegates copies of the poem he had written in praise of foreign emigration. I read the poem and referred to the grievances of the settlers in South Africa. Just at this moment, Mr. Vacha rang the bell. I was sure I had not spoken for five minutes. I did not know that the bell was rung in order to warn me to finish in two minutes more. I had heard the others speak for half an hour or three quarters of an hour, and yet no bell was rung. I felt hurt and sat down as soon as the bell was rung, but my childlike intellect thought that the poem contained an answer to Sir Firosha. There was no question about the passing of the resolution. In those days, there was hardly any difference between visitors and delegates. Everyone raised their hands, and all resolutions passed unanimously. My resolution also fared in this wise and lost all its importance for me. And yet the very fact that it was passed by the Congress was enough to delight my heart. The knowledge that the imprantor of the Congress meant that the whole of country was enough to delight anyone. Lord Curzon's Zarba. The Congress was over, but as I had to meet the Chamber of Commerce and various people in connection with work in South Africa, I stayed in Calcutta for a month. Rather than stay this time in a hotel, I arranged to get the required introduction for a room in the India Club. Among its members were some prominent Indians, and I looked forward to getting into touch with them and interesting them in the work in South Africa. Gokhale frequently went to his club to play billiards, and when he knew that I was to stay in Calcutta for some time, he invited me to stay with him. I thankfully accepted the invitation, but did not think it proper to go there myself. He waited for a day or two and then took me personally. He discovered my reserve and said, Gandhi, you have to stay in this country and this sort of reserve will not do. You must get in touch with as many people as possible. I want you to do Congress work. I shall record here an incident in the India Club before I proceed to talk of my stay in Gokhale. Lord Curzon held his darbar about this time. Some Rajas and Maharajas who had been invited to the darbar were members of the club. In the club, I always found them wearing fine Bengali dhotis and shirts and scarves. On the darbar day, they put on trousers, befitting kamsas and shining boots. I was pained and inquired as of one of them the reason for the change. We alone know our unfortunate condition. We alone know the insults that we have to put up with. 
in order that we may possess our wealth and title he replied but what about the khansam khansama turbans and the shining boots i asked don't you see any difference between the khansamas and us he replied and added those are our khansamas we are lord cousins khansamas if i were to absent myself from the levy i would have to suffer the consequences and if i were to attend it in my usual dress it would be an offense and do you think i'm going to get an opportunity there of talking to lord cousin not a bit of it i was moved to pity for his, for this plain spoken friend that reminds me of another daba at the time when lord hard hardinge laid the foundation stone of the hindu university there was a daba there were rajas and maharajas of course but pandit malviya ji specially invited me also to attend it and i did so i was distressed to see the maharajas bedecked be, be like women silk pajamas and silk achkans pearl necklaces around their leg necks bracelets around their wrists pearl and diamond tassels on the turbans and besides this swords with golden hilts hanging from their waistbands i discovered that these were the insignia not only of their royalty but of their slavery i had thought that they must be wearing these badges of importance of their own free will but i was told that it was obligatory for the rajas to wear the, all the costly jewels at such functions i had also gathered that some of them had a positive dislike for wearing these jewels and they never wore them except on occasions like the darbar i do not know how far my information was correct but whether they wear them on occasions or not it is distressing enough to have to attend with serious with serious with serious darbars and jewels that only women wear how heavy is the toll of sins and wrong that wealth power and prestige exact from man 17 a month with gokhale one from the very first day of my stay with him gokhale made me feel completely at home he treated me as though i was his younger brother he acquainted himself with all my requirements and arranged to see that i got all i needed fortunately my wants were few and i had cultivated a habit of self help i needed very little personal attendance he was deeply impressed with my habit of fending for myself my personal cleanliness perseverance and regularity and we would often overwhelm me with praise he seemed to keep nothing private from me he would introduce me with all the important people that called on him and those the one who stands foremost in my memory is dr now sir pc ray he lived practically next door and was a very frequent visitor and that's how he introduced dr ray this is professor ray who having a monthly salary of rupees 800 keeps just 40 for himself and devotes the balance to public purposes he is not and does not want to get married i see little difference between dr ray as he is today and as he used to be then his dress used to be as simple as nearly as simple as it is with a difference of course that whereas it is khadi now it used to be indian milk cloth those days i felt i could never hear too much of the talks between gokhale and dr ray as they all pertain to the public good and were of educative nature at times they were painful to containing as they did strictures on public men as a result some of those some of those who i regarded as stalwart fighters began to look quite puny to see gokhale at work was as much a joy as education he never wasted a minute his private relations and friendships were all for public good all his talks had a reference only to the good of the country and were absolutely free from any trace of untruth or insincerity India's poverty and subject subjection were matters of constraint and intense dis, uh, concern for him. Various people sought to interest him in different things, but he gave everyone the same reply: "You do the thing yourself. Let me do my own work. What I want is freedom for my country. After that is one we can think of other things. Today, that one thing is enough to engage all my time and energy." his reverence for ranade could be seen in every moment ranade's authority was final in every matter and he would cite it in at every step the anniversary of ranade's death or birth i forget which occurred during my stay with gokhale who observed it with regular who observed it regularly <coughs> they were with him besides myself his friends professor kartwate and a sub judge He invited us to take part in the celebration and in a speech he gave us a reminiscence of Ranade. He compared incidentally Ranade, Telang and Mandalik. He eulogized Telang's charming style and Mandalik's greatness as a reformer. Citing an instance of Mandalik's solicitude for clients, he told us an anecdote of as to how once having missed his usual train, he engaged a special train so as to be able to attend the court in the interest of his client. But Ranade he said towered above all of them as a versatile genius 
He was not only a great judge, but an equally great historian, economist, and reformer. Although he was a judge, he fearlessly attended the Congress, and everyone had such confidence in his sagacity that they unquestioningly accepted his decision. Gokhale's joy knew no bounds as he described these qualities of head and heart, which were all combined in this master. Gokhale used to have a horse carriage in those days. I do not know the circumstances that made a horse carriage a necessity for him, and so I remonstrated with him. Can't you make use of the tram car in going about from place to place? It is it derogatory to a leader's dignity? <coughs> Slightly pained, he said, "So you have failed to understand me. I do not use my counsel's allowances for my personal comforts. I envy your liberty to go about in tram cars, but I am sorry I cannot do likewise." When you are the victim of a wide a publicity as I am, it will be difficult, if not impossible, for you to go about in a tram car. There is no reason to suppose that every everything that a leaders do is with a view of personal comfort. I love your simple habits. I live as simply as I can, but some expense is almost inevitable for a man like myself. He thus satisfactorily deposed me of one of my complaints, but there was another for which he could not dispose to my satisfaction. But you do not even go out for walks. Said I, it is surprising that you should be always ailing. Such public work leave no time for physical exercise. Where do you find me free to go out for a walk? He replied. I had such a great regard for Gokhale that I never strove with him. Though his reply was far from satisfying me, I remained silent. I believed then, and I believe now, that no matter what amount of work one has, one should always find time for exercise, just as one does for one's meals. It is my humble opinion. Far from taking away from one's capacity for work, it adds to it. Okay, with this we will uh, take a break for now. Uh, what are the things that we need to unpack at uh, this juncture? First is the part about him uh, planning his exit from South Africa. Uh, as soon as Gandhi, uh, Gandhi uh, decided to leave from South Africa, there was the question of having a farewell party and a farewell party meant gifts. Gandhi received a lot of gifts, a lot, a lot of them being ornaments, gold, silver, pearls, uh, so on and so forth, gold watches, uh, Gandhi felt a little ashamed of taking it uh, because he had done the work that he had done as public service and to accept something in lieu of the public service to him uh, diluted the essence of why he was doing anything. Uh, this is what he thought and he had his sons uh, who agreed with him but not his wife and so he used his sons as what he calls his attorneys. He since his sons were uh, also in the view that they should not keep the gifts, he said, why don't you convince your mother? The mother was not convinced. She said that Gandhi had forever taken all her ornaments away and made sure that she never enjoyed these pleasures. And she understood that the children did not want it and they, their own children also will not want it, which is her grandchildren, because the children will convince them so. But what about the daughters-in-law? Why should they be deprived? And if they ask for something, when where would Gandhi get all the gold and jewelry and all ornaments for them? So to which Gandhi could not argue with her immediately, but later he kind of uh, uh, told her that uh, the children are very far away from getting married. We will not have them go through child marriage like we did. And when they get do get decide to get married, we will definitely not get daughter-in-laws who are uh, ambitious or desirous of gold and ornaments. So. That's how he closed the topic. What he did was he took all the gifts that he received in 1896-1901 and then put together, put it in a trust and the trust obviously earned money from it. Uh, as for public service, whenever he wanted, he would, he had the opportunity of taking money from the entire trust. But as Gandhi uh, later said, he never had the opportunity to take money from that trust and the, the money continued to remain with the trust and it continues to remain at the time the book is written. So this is as far as the uh, the gifts uh, that were concerned. Uh, obviously after this the farewell party happened and uh, he left uh, for India. In India he lands up first in Calcutta uh, uh, and then he goes to Bombay. Uh, in Bombay he has to meet Firosha Mehta and the only way to meet Firosha Mehta and get a proper appointment from him would be uh, in the train to Bombay and so he gets a special salon, uh, Firosha Mehta travels in a special salon which is I guess those days first class. So Gandhi also took a ticket in that and spent some time. Gandhi's main uh, uh, 
topic to discuss with all the big leaders uh, like Firoz Shah, Mehta and other leaders in the Congress was passing the South Africa resolution. Uh, a lot of them felt uh, like uh, uh, like Firoz Shah, Mehta and uh, uh, who is the other gentleman whose name I'm forgetting, uh, Ranade, uh, felt that oh, what is the point of this fight? Where as as long as Indians do not have rights in their own country, what is the point of fighting for the rights of Indians in the colonies of England? So this is the point that they had. Anyway, Gandhi was determined to uh, get the Congress pass a resolution on the South Africa on on the on South Africa. So he visited Calcutta again. He spent a lot of time in Calcutta. He interacted with Gokhale. He attended the Congress meeting, uh, and uh, uh, the meeting went on for hours together. His resolution was obviously one of the last to be discussed and uh, when the the, uh, the discussion came people wanted to know who supported it and Gokhale was the one who had supported it they asked him whether he's read it he said he's read it and so it was passed without any issue Gandhi did not like the way that the resolution was passed he wanted people to understand and appreciate it and not just pass randomly because Gokhale had read it uh, in which case he wanted to be part of Congress and uh, uh, the only way he could do that was to uh, serve as a volunteer, uh, my words not written in the book, but um, so he did that, he uh, volunteered as a, uh, as uh, almost like a peon who would, uh, a bearer rather, who, who, so one of his first jobs was to uh, pick out all the meals that the secretary received and go through them, was there anything important that needed response was, or was there all crap in them which he can he could just throw away. Gandhi was far more qualified to do this kind of work so he got away and got this done completely very very fast. The secretary obviously was impressed with him. Gandhi went a step further and almost became, became his personal secretary. He was also buttoned his shirt and the secretary would be very happy uh, that he had somebody to do that. He would uh, proudly say that look I don't even have time to button my shirts and Gandhi felt that that was quite lame but of obviously his respect for elders stopped him from saying that. Uh, then Gandhi to, goes on to talk about his experiences staying with Gokhale. Uh, again this is again in Calcutta, Gokhale was very loving towards Gandhi Gokhale, uh, and Gandhi learned a lot from Gokhale, he looked up to Gokhale and other leaders of the Congress. Uh, Gokhale had almost like a darbar wherever he went, uh, all the best minds of the country came and spoke to him. Gandhi found that whole experience as uh, as education for himself and uh, he learned from it. There's also uh, a, a lot of description on Lord Curzon's darbar. I don't think that's important. If it comes up later, we will discuss about it in detail. So this is as far as uh, whatever we've read today. And uh, I don't think there's anything important, more important that I've missed out. Uh, let's catch up in the next chapter. Thank you very much. And uh, do drop in your comments below in the comment section. Uh, take care. Good night. Bye-bye.